Good morning again. We are really looking forward to um, seeing you again. Well, not really seeing you, but knowing you're there uh, uh, on the second day of EPOS 2020 webinars. Of course, we would have loved to be in Thessaloniki now uh, and meeting you all in person, but this is a really good second best. And today we will go more into depth on three different subjects, um, pathophysiology and twice treatment. Um, I would like to introduce my co-chair to, of today, although I really know she doesn't need any introduction, but um, my co-chair is Professor Valerie Lund, um, uh, former professor in London, in the National Heart and Lung, and already fifth, for 15 years working together with me on EPOS and many other things like Rhinology Journal and ERS and a very good friend. Valerie, let me hand over to you to uh, start the rest of this session. Thanks very much, uh, Vitska, and once again, welcome to everybody who's joined us. Um, we've got uh, a wonderful presentation for you from uh, Professor Rob Kern, um, who's an old friend of ours. He uh, is the chairman of the Department of ENT and Head and Neck Surgery at the Northwestern uh, University in Chicago. Um, he's an excellent surgeon, but he and his uh, team, his laboratory team, have contributed a lot um, on the area of pathophysiology uh, in CRS. And that's what his presentation is going to consider and uh, let us know uh, what is new and what is the um, uh, advances that we can look forward to. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, we're going to talk for the next uh, 30 to 35 minutes about the inflammatory mechanisms of chronic rhinosinusitis. And first of all, I'd like to thank Professors Fulkins and Lund for the opportunity to speak here today. And um, here are my disclosures. They're, they're not going to be really relevant to the discussion here. Um, but when we talk about chronic rhinosinusitis, this is a, uh, a clinical definition subjective symptoms confirmed by objective findings, either endoscopy or CT scan. It's not a really a very specific definition. It's really a, a syndrome. It's typically divided into two phenotypes or clinical patterns with and without polyps. Now, uh, the phenotypes really are, there are more specific phenotypes. Uh, that's not the topic today, but I, I just wanna mention it that the vast majority of chronic rhinosinusitis, both with and without polyps, is still not very well defined from a standpoint of phenotypes. It has very, very little we can say about the specific uh, pattern or, or clinical behavior. We do know in general that older patients, asthmatics tend to do poorly and younger patients tend to do better. Uh, but the CRS phenotypes, the clinical pictures are not particularly useful in predicting how the patient is going to do. Um, so that's why research really probably about 30 years ago began in earnest to try and figure out what the cause of chronic rhinosinus really was. Now, again, it's a broad clinical syndrome and there are two basic pathways to disease. One is mechanical, osteomatal complex blockage and the other one is mucosal inflammation. Osteomatal blockage is, you can see right here, it's a mechanical process. This was studied thoroughly by Messerklinger um, and it, it's, it's really fairly well understood. The diffuse inflammatory process, however, that's superimposed on this is not as well understood and is really the driver of most of the problematic sinusitis that we encounter. So the, the topic here is really centers around what are the causes of this and what are the inflammatory mechanisms that are invoked by those causes. Now, beginning uh, in an attempt to sort of understand a disease better, a number of theories were put forth as far as what causes chronic rhinosinusitis. And these were all reviewed extensively in EPOS 2012. And they had fungal hypothesis, superantigens, biofilms, microbiome, allergy, as well as some host factors had to do with eicosanoid imbalances or the, or the host immune response in general. And these were all more or less debated on multiple continents, as a matter of fact. But there's a general consensus that the sinus mucosa is the site of interface with the external environment. And in health, this interaction occurs with minimal, if any, inflammation. 
the mucosa essentially serves as an immune barrier. And here you can see this cartoon just describing it. Uh, up top here, there's the mechanical aspects of the barrier, the mucus, as well as the tight junctions holding the cells together. And then it's backed up by the, the true immune uh, response, the innate and, and adaptive immune responses. But in patients with chronic sinusitis, these host and environmental factors interact. And typically in adulthood, the disease presents, the barrier is penetrated and a chronic inflammation, self-perpetuating inflammation results. And this leads to chronic rhinosinusitis. This occurs in, in really in middle age, in the early 40s in the CRS without polyp patients, in the late 40s on average in the polypoid patients. Now, what's happening in those 40 years before that? Well, we really don't know, except we, we do have some idea that there's likely crosstalk between the host and the environment, the microbiome, the, uh, the bacteriology and fungal uh, 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 commensals become established. There's a relationship between the host and, the, and these um, um, uh, microorganisms. There's a defense host defense aspect, which is sort of sharpened as well as symbiosis. There's likely many products that these bacteria produce that are beneficial, both locally and systemically. And superimposed on this are stochastic events like a viral infection, which may throw things off, as well as the dietary factors the, uh, and environmental exposure, such as weather, which influence over a course of 40 years. This is obviously very complex. Uh, there's, there's been a theory proposed that now about 40 years ago that early life exposures are important in um, setting the tone for how the immune system develops. And this is referred to as the hygiene hypothesis and the absence of adequate bacterial exposures results in a skewing of the immune response towards allergy and atopy. Um, there's a belief that there's a gut airway access, that the, bac the bacteria in the gut established early in life are important in more or less training the immune system and promoting tolerance. The short-chain fatty acids, at, at the last point there, are generated by bacteria in the gut, which are absorbed and have a systemic effect, and we think this is protective. Now, when this process goes awry, the atopic march takes place, this has been well described, and you, this marches through the early development. There's a tendency to skew or, or um, uh, distort the immune response when the proper environmental exposures aren't in place. Now you notice this goes across pretty much every surface of the body. You don't see any mention of sinusitis. Well, it's possible that there is a progression of this A to B into the sinus mucosa. The relationship between allergy and chronic sinusitis is not particularly well understood. It's it's actually uh, a, a, an area of high debate, but, but we do know that um, younger patients do tend to look be do better. And it's possible that a, 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 a narrow IgE uh, focused response may cause sinusitis or sinusitis like symptoms in, in, the, uh, in the sinuses. Um, that this is generally thought to be milder, um, but this is an area uh, of, of ongoing debate. Most of the interest is not on the younger patients, however, it's on the older patients that are the more severe um, uh, patterns of disease. These are the patients that, uh, that the, they're more likely to need surgery, they're more likely to, uh, to fail surgery and to fail aggressive treatment. Now, so we're trying, there were efforts were made to, to define what are the important factors, but we don't really know what the factors are in the population as a whole, nor we certainly don't know what factors are, are uh, relevant in an individual patient. In other words, how they got to have chronic chronic sinusitis, what are the specific genetic or environmental factors. It's very difficult to, to study this. And, and would it matter once the patient has the disease, would knowing that it had to do with uh, some exposures in childhood, you can't go turn back the clock. So most of the interest has, has shifted away from trying to define these factors over here to rather than looking at what caused the problem, the, the, the focus is on the result. What mechanistic pathways are invoked? So we believe that if the environmental and host factors are different, you're gonna end up with a different endotype, different mechanisms, different molecular pathways invoked. So this is where the interest is at present.
And if you look at this, by way of definition, a genotype is the genetic makeup that underwrites a disease. The endotype uh, is the subtype of disease dis defined by a distinct path pathophysiologic mechanism or molecular pathway. The phenotype is the observable clinical characteristics. And really, although we know there's some genes that have an effect, and multiple genes that likely have an effect, most have a, a small effect size. In other words, individually, the genes do not generally determine disease. And the environmental factors are probably far more important. And that re, uh, sort of relates to the fact that the disease is latent onset. In other words, in the 40s and 50s. The, and with the, the singular exception here is the, uh, the uh, cystic fibrosis gene, and that is childhood. That's a dominant gene. Now, the endotypes, again, is where the new classification systems are, and this is where the interest is. The phenotypes are the clinical groupings, and they're still the basis of most treatment patterns at present. In other words, whether you see polyps or don't see polyps. So we, because we think that the endotype drives the phenotype. And not only that, that once the barrier is penetrated, the endotype is established, that this drives things like remodeling, the changes in the tissue, as well as the natural history and the outcomes. And also there's a connection to lower airway disease with asthma or bronchiectasis as the entire respiratory tract tends to be uh, involved in many patients. So what are the endotypes of CRS and how can they guide treatment? Well, the first study that really addresses a very influential study from a few years ago it was a European consortium that took an array of biomarkers and clinical, um, clinical uh, points and um, studied them in uh, about 200 surgical patients and did a sort of modified cluster analysis and came up with 10 patterns um, that you could, that may or may not predict um, disease. And what it does do, it does correlate reasonably well with the presence of asthma or the presence of polyps. The weakness of this is that there's not really a good path forward. The items that were suggested that, that developed these 10, 10 groupings um, that you can see up here were, were more or less pre-selected. They aren't based on uh, particular mechanisms themselves, and, uh, but they're also not hypothesis free. In other words, they're not a global analysis of all um, um, output of, of um, uh, in other words, they're not hypothesis free. So it's difficult to move forward from that. But if you back up and look at the sino and nasal immunity, once the barrier is penetrated, the innate and um, adaptive responses can be categorized. And they're guided really by the innate lymphocyte cells, which were uh, really discovered in the, in the last decade or so. And they, they can they uh, hone or, or help guide responses in one of three directions primarily, type one, type two, and type three. Type one responses um, are associated with uh, Th1 cells and they're ge ge geared against viruses and intracellular organisms. Type two are against parasites and also they're also important in tissue repair. And type three are the tip typical extracellular organisms and they each have an associated um, T cell subset as well. They have particular patterns of effector cells that are characteristic of each of the three types of inflammation. And they have particular cytokines, canonical cytokines. So what you can do is grind up the tissue in patients and determine which patterns of inflammation are present. And this is a different way of looking at endotypes. So by this, uh, by this analysis, you will come up with not 10 endotypes, but you'll come up with eight. Um, both actually, both, both um, systems have a non-typable version, which doesn't fit any of the patterns. But, it, but if there's three, one, two, and three, these are the possible permutations here. So you end up with eight total. Now, if you look at um, CRS in Chicago, our group looked at this and it shows that there's an enormous percentage, particularly in polypoid sinusitis of type two inflammation. Type two is also highly present in non-polypoid sinusitis. The uh, inflammatory patterns are similarly apparent um, and in other areas of the world. Um, they're somewhat similar and the world is in general moving in the TH2 direction. 
Now, 60% at present of CRS total is T2, type 2. Now, the type 2 inflammation is particularly important because it's associated with treatment failure. It's also associated with asthma, and eosinophilia, and a much higher rate of polyp formation. This figure shows the um, type 2 inflammatory uh, cascade. This was uh, a modified version of what was present in EPOS 2012. And if we look here, the barrier is penetrated. The barrier is penetrated, um, and TSLP was the primary um, uh, epithelial cytokine identified at that time. It sets in motion the ILC2 cells, the TH2 cells, which also in, in many patients lead to a, these uh, aggregate of plasma cells, which, which generate large amounts of uh, antibodies, which are directed against uh, what's present in the mucus and what penetrates the barrier. And the cytokines also attract effector cells, which are then armed with those antibodies. Those antibodies then secondarily encounter the antigens, they degranulate, and they cause the tissue damage and the changes that are seen in type 2 inflammation. Now, the updated version here in 2012 shows some modifications. There are other key cytokines that appear to be involved. And in some cases, the inflammation is so severe that we get uh, and autoantibodies performed against self proteins here, particularly damaging to the barrier. And also, we're, we become aware of, more aware of the importance of IL 13, which is important in driving many of the changes in the tissue, in particular, the formation of polyps and the weakening of the barrier. This is all about type 2 inflammation. And to follow up on that point, this, the endotypes we think drive the tissue changes that you will observe. And the two basic types of tissue changes seen in type 2 inflammation are the formation of polyps and damage to the epithelial barrier. Now, what is a polyp? Well, uh, here's a, a, an endoscopic view of one. Um, but what are polyps? They're not collagen. Here's a polyp, and there's not much collagen in there. There's less, actually, than a typical tissue. What they are are fibrin, um, uh, and fibrin is deposited in the, in the polyp. And what this means is that the um, uh, their fibrin cross-linking? It's it's a kind of a modified blood clot, um, and at the tissue level, the inflammation causes um, a degree of um, exudate, which then will start to uh, a fibrin matrix will start to form. But what's called tissue plasminogen activator, which is an enzyme in the tissue, TPA activates plasmin, breaks these fibrin monomer, uh, in down into monomers and dimers, and they go away. Uh, so no matrix is formed. But in the presence of type 2 inflammation with high levels of IL-13, the um, plasma, is uh, plasma is activated and the, uh, or I'm sorry, plasma, uh, plasma activation is blocked and the fibrin matrix forms and this uh, water comes into the, into the tissue and this causes the swelling within the fibrin matrix was associated with the polyps. Now, the reason why polyps form in the ethmoid and not in the floor of the nose or the lungs or the inferior turbinate is because the endogenous levels of TPA vary. In the ethmoid sinuses, they're low, so IL-13 can suppress them. In the other tissues, they're much higher, so it's much harder for IL-13 to suppress TPA. Now, the TPA is mostly produced by the epithelial cells, so the IL-13 is suppressing them here. But Short chain fatty acids produced by bacteria do upregulate TPA and can actually stimulate uh, TPA production. So, therefore, the right bacteria theoretically present in the, in the microbiome could pr be protective against the formation of nasal polyps. So, barrier damage is also a type of remodeling seen with type 2 inflammation. The barrier uh, in, with type 2 inflammation is weak. It's immature, it's in a chronically, what's called an, an epithelial mesenchymal transition state. And when it's severe enough, we, we would use the term barrier failure. And you look at the epithelium here of patients with type two inflammation, there's a heaped up or a, uh, or a, a sort of lost barrier as well. Both patterns are seen. You can see that here in some of these slides. And what that looks like, uh, it's a, there's an abnormal repair mechanism in type two inflammation. And you can see here, this is the, if the barrier is damaged in a normal 
a patient without inflammation, they restore the epithelium very nicely, a normal barrier. But with type two inflammation, there's this heaped up epithelium and shredded epithelium. Uh, and ultimately the healing is very abnormal and weak. And, and this is here an illustration of it. This allows much freer access of antigens. And if you look at this di diagram of uh, the progression of type two inflammation, the barrier penetration occurs after perhaps 40 years of exposures that sets in motion a type two inflammation. Now we don't know why it goes in a type two direction. That's one of the great unanswered questions. But once that type two inflammation gets going, the, uh, the barrier ends up getting damaged and weakened and that causes more antigens to go forward and creates a feed forward mechanism of progression. And when it gets severe enough, the barrier is actually uh, essentially incompetent and allows free access. It gets very severe so much so that the, the, um, the, the body starts reacting to some self antigens locally and these are directed against the epithelium further damaging the barrier. And ultimately the levels of type two cytokines, like IL-13, suppress TPA that causes the fibrin matrix to form, draws in water and you have polyps. The, net, the, the overall idea here is the formation of polyps is a function of disease intensity. The more severe will exhibit the, the, the polyps. Now there may be patients who are relatively protected against that if they have very high levels of TPA or, or other factors that we don't really quite understand yet. So barrier failure is probably distinct from what takes place initially to allow barrier penetration, but this has not been studied at this point. So we think a chronically weak barrier predisposes to recurrence and why additional treatment is often needed after surgery and why the recurrence rate is so much higher from type two patients with type two disease. Now, not all sinusitis is type two, as I mentioned, they're mixed patterns as well as um, and non, completely non-two type two. So what about remodeling in outside the type two setting? Well, it turns out that type one cytokines and probably type three to a degree can suppress TPA as well, but they don't do it as effectively, which is likely why polyps are less common in type one and type three inflammation. Um, but they can suppress it. This is more commonly seen in Asia. Now type one inflammation, this is a diagram of this, uh, of hypo, uh, hypothetical type one inflammation. There is some barrier damage from neutrophils. Um, similarly with type three inflammation, there is some barrier damage, but it's significantly less than with type two inflammation. So in non-type two inflammation, the barrier remains more intact. Their polyps are still fibrin, but there's less likely to form polyps. It's, the polyps are more common in type two inflammation because IL-13 is more effective at suppressing TPA than type one and type three cytokines. And also type two inflammation causes barrier failure, which is likely to drive uh, levels. You, you get a feed forward mechanism um, in type two inflammation that you don't see in type one and type three. Now in terms of the endotypes, um, again, the, the, the separation now is into type one, and three versus type two, we don't really, we aren't able to distinguish. Well, first of all, we don't know why it goes in one direction or the other. And there are probably subtypes of these, uh, of each type, but, uh, and also the mixtures of patients that are type one. But from a standpoint of simplicity, um, there tends to be fibrosis and, and fibrin polyps, but they're less common. The barrier remains intact. And this is more closely associated with bronchiectasis. Type two inflammation is associated with barrier failure asthma and fibrin polyps and less likely to have fibrosis. In terms of treatment, antibiotics are more likely to work in this setting. Corticosteroid effect is, is present but weaker and surgery is certainly an option. Similarly here, but biologics are, are available now that can target type two inflammation. Corticosteroid effect is much stronger. Thank you for your attention. Well, Thank you very much, Rob. That was an excellent overview on uh, inflammation in CRS and uh, extremely important to understand. You know, we're back from the area where we gave uh, nasal uh, steroids to everybody and uh, did surgery if that didn't work. We now really have to understand all these forms of inflammation to understand the best choices for our treatments.
Uh, a number of questions have come in already, so um, Valerie and I will try to uh, answer those. And one of the questions was, how important is the reaction to staph androtoxins in the pathophysiology of CRS? Um, well, the short answer is nobody knows exactly, but um, um, you could argue that uh, um, superantigens that can be produced by staph um, um, play a role in stimulating inflammation um, and producing TH2 cytokines. And especially in patients where there is barrier dysfunction, you can imagine that staph has a, um, a negative influence. So it's an environmental factor that influences the disease. That's what the common uh, thinking is about. Um, and that also uh, is reflected by uh, the more severe patients showing uh, more of these superantigens than less severe patients. Another question was, um, excellent presentation, thank you. That's for Rob. And then um, was IgE, uh, systemic or local, assist in the endotyping assessment? Thank you. Well, of course, IgE is a very important part of the TH2 endotype. Um, it is a result of uh, uh, TH2 inflammation, but also part of the circle. All these inflammations are circles influencing and IgE production on basophils and, and mast cells uh, is an important, has an important role. And you can see that when, while blocking IgE, for example, with omalitumab, we will talk about that later, um, actually reduces the amount of TH2 inflammation. So yes, the uh, IgE has an important role in the en uh, endotyping, pointing to TH2 inflammation and to uh, treatment that is relevant for uh, type 2 inflammation. So that the range, next, uh, yes. The next question is fascinating. It's um, how accurate to today is the Far East or Asian, is it that the Far East and the Asian patients have more type 1 stroke 3 neutrophilic nasal polyps? And if accurate, why the geographical discrepancy? I mean, this is a really fascinating observation that started being made some uh, years ago, uh, certainly in uh, Korea, um, less so, but in Japan and certain parts of China, um, at the time of the studies, it was clear that the um, the eosinophilic dominance was less uh, obvious in those uh, patients. Um, and obviously one can speculate that it's a combination of genetic and, and environmental factors that determines this, um, because what we see uh, really interestingly is that with time, there have been some very nice sequential studies done uh, in Tokyo, uh, looking at comparing tissue taken 20 years ago on polyps and comparing them with today and showing that this uh, neutrophilic appearance is disappearing in favour of a more uh, type 2 uh, pattern. And that was the um, comment made by Professor Kurt about the direction of travel being T2, whether it's related to pollution, whether it's related to the hygiene hypothesis, nobody's quite sure. Um, there has been a very uh, interesting study done in Malaysia, uh, looking mm -hmm. at the uh, changes in polyp between three uh, ethnic, well-defined ethnic groups, Malaysian, uh, Chinese um, and Indian. And again, that does continue to show that the Chinese have a less eosinophilic dominant uh, pattern compared to the other groups. But again, this, this may well change. So it's intriguing. We don't have a complete explanation, uh, but it's certainly something that um, offers some, some uh, considerable interest for research. Okay, thanks. Yeah, another question was, um, uh, and uh, I uh, would like to point out that all the questions we are not able to answer now, we will uh, uh, answer later um, and put them on the website of Equals 2020. So uh, when your question has not been answered now, uh, you, will, you can find an answer there and that will uh, make a nice library of, of questions. Uh, the question was, would you be able to share your opinion on what, what factors break the epithelial barrier and how this triggers the onset and development of CRS? 
Well, as uh, uh, Professor Kern already explained, there are two moments probably uh, that are quite different. The moment in, in youth um, and uh, later during the development of the CRS. Um, we're not absolutely sure at the moment, I think, whether it's a, a repair dysfunction or actually uh, a breaking. There is a continuous um, uh, damage of the epithelium. That's a normal reaction that you, that you can, can easily find when taking biopsies in the nose. There are always places where the epithelium is disrupted. Um, but uh, it seems that in CRS, there is a the ongoing inflammation reduces the possibility to repair the um, the uh, epithelial barrier, and there are a number of different um, uh, proteins um, uh, working there to keep the barrier intact. But we're not exact; we don't know exactly which of these uh, uh, barrier proteins are. Uh, influenced by the inflammation and in that way prevent the repair of the barrier. Um, I think we think can probably that, move on now. What do you think? Sorry, we? I think we should move on to your presentation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. to keep on from the interests of time. Um, so obviously, um, those of you who were here yesterday um, heard our, my introduction for Professor Falkins. Everybody knows her anyway. She's the um, main architect and the force behind the whole EPOS project. Um, and uh, that has gone on for the last uh, 16 years. It's just flown by. So <laughs> here she is again. Uh, and I'm delighted that she's now going to talk to us about how to implement current and new treatment options in CRF, particularly in relation to uh, precision medicine. Today I would like to discuss with you how the new classification in EPOS 2020 can help you to treat your chronic rhinosinusitis patients, how to implement current and new treatment options and the role of precision medicine. We will discuss the new classification of chronic rhinosinusitis with primary versus secondary chronic rhinosinusitis and especially what the consequences are for the treatment. We will, I will show you the new integrated care pathways in chronic rhinosinusitis and especially discuss new treatment options with biologicals. To understand the new classification of chronic rhinosinusitis, it's mandatory to really understand the different types of inflammation in chronic rhinosinusitis, and Professor Rob Kern discussed that extensively with you uh, today. And I would only like to point that for the biological treatment, especially the type 2 inflammation, ex is extremely important. So the new classification of chronic rhinosinusitis, and we went into it already a little bit yesterday, but I want to do it a little bit more. We first classify chronic rhinosinusitis as primary or secondary. And for primary CRS, we uh, divide between localized disease and diffuse disease. And then both are divided by endotype dominance into type 2 or non-type 2. For the different phenotypes, you can imagine uh, for a localized form of a type 2 disease, for example, uh, a localized allergic fungal rhinosinusitis. For non-type 2, an isolated sinusitis. For diffuse bilateral type 2 disease, typical chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps. Allergic fungal rhinosinusitis all over the place. Eosinophilic chronic rhinosinusitis. Compartmental allergic disease. And for non-type 2, non-eosinophilic chronic rhinosinusitis. Let's look at some examples. And I would like to point to you how this classification is important in deciding what to do. Here you see a unilateral allergic fungal rhinosinusitis. So localized disease, type two, 
Of course, in a localized disease, very often surgery is the treatment of choice. And in this case, we would go for surgery, perioperative systemic corticosteroids, and maybe immunotherapy. You can find all the evidence about treating allergic fungal rhinosinusitis in the new EPOS 2020. Here an example of a non-type 2 isolated sinusitis. Why is it so important to have this precision medicine? When you follow this new classification, you end up with isolated sinusitis. And it's obvious that an isolated sinusitis like this should have a surgical treatment. Intranasal steroids won't help. Anti-inflammatory treatment won't help. This frontal sinus has been closed off by um, osteoneogenesis and needs to be um, opened surgically. Here an example of diffuse bilateral type 2 massive chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps. In a case like this, normally we would probably say we have a choice. Systemic steroids, maybe a biological, intranasal steroids will not help when the nose is so blocked off. But of course in this case where the polyps tend to destroy the bone here in the frontal sinus and here also we do not have another choice than starting with surgery. But surgery alone will not be enough. It doesn't change the diffuse bilateral disease, uh, the type 2 inflammation. So even if we have done surgery, we will need systemic steroids, intranasal steroids and probably biologicals to um, improve the um, situation of this patient and get the disease under control. If we think about secondary chronic rhinosinusitis, we have a totally different ballgame. Again, we want to differentiate between localized and diffuse disease. Um, in the localized form, uh, you can think of auto odontogenic disease or a fungal ball tumor. In diffuse disease, um, in children, PCD, cystic fibrosis, um, uh, uh, inflammatory vasculitis like GPA, Wegener's disease or EGPA, Church-Strauss, and a selective immunodeficiency. Of course, for all these diseases, the chronic rhinosinusitis is part of a larger problem and usually the larger problem needs to be addressed. So here you see an example of a bilateral odontogenic chronic rhinosinusitis. You see the sinuses apart from the maxillary sinus are absolutely fine. And here this uh, teeth problem. Of course, we need to uh, address the teeth problem first before we have to address a chronic rhinosinusitis that is uh, here in the maxillary sinus on both sides. Another example, a patient with an ANCA positive G, uh, GPA. We cannot help this patient with only local treatment or surgery. Uh, the patients need uh, systemic treatment. And in this case, the patient needed rituximab. And my role was with local ointments and some uh, steroids and antibiotic local treatments to have uh, as, as little crusts in the nose as possible. But and I cannot locally cure this patient. The GPA needs to be addressed by an immunologist. Here another example, a patient with uh, chronic rhinosinusitis in, uh, and an e, uh, IgA deficiency. You see the sinus is nicely open, but still all the time there is um, mucopernant secretion. And this patient was... Um, made significantly better with long-term antibiotics. So if we combine all these uh, data from EPOS 2020, we came up with these integrated care pathways for chronic rhinosinusitis. Um, and today I would like to go into 
the, uh, the last part here that is most interesting for uh, otorhinolaryngologists, the diffuse bilateral chronic rhinosinusitis or localized unilateral chronic rhinosinusitis. Um, and especially here in the diffuse uh, bilateral chronic rhinosinusitis, we would like to look here at this uh, last part of the cartoon where we talk about additional therapy and precision treatment in uh, patient and mainly in patients with type 2 um, uh, disease. As we discussed before, type 2 inflammation, uh, the most important cytokines of type 2 inflammation are NTL5, NTL4 and 13 and anti-IgE and all these cytokines now have biologicals to uh, oppose them. For NTL5, it's mepolizumab and mesolizumab. For NTL4 uh, and IL13, dupilumab. And for anti-IgE, omalizumab. Um, at this moment, only dupilumab is available in most of the Western world as, prime, as treatment for patients uh, with chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps. But very uh, likely omalizumab and mepolizumab will follow in the next year. Here you have an example of uh, dupilumab and the percentage of patients that improved. Uh, and you can see that there is a significant effect of dupilumab uh, every two weeks here. And in this cartoon, in the second part, uh, patients going from every two weeks of treatment to a treatment once a month or every four weeks. And you see that over a year, there is a significant and ongoing improvement in the nasal polyp score. If we now try to compare all the studies available with biologics at this moment uh, in, the, in the literature, you see there are studies done with the pilimab, with mepolizumab, and there are more with mepolizumab coming, and omalizumab. And here you see the effect on the SNOT22. And every time you see the, ba uh, the placebo and then the treatment, placebo, treatment, placebo, treatment. And you can see in all these that the placebo effect is small and there is a significant and large impact on the SNOT22 in all uh, these three arms of the study. The same here for mepolizumab, small placebo effect, large effect of mepolizumab. And the same here for omalizumab. So all these biologicals have a significant impact on the SNOT22. Here you see a cartoon of the nasal congestion score. Again, a significant effect of dupilumab, of mepolizumab, and of omalizumab. It seems that the effect of omalizumab was a little bit smaller, but these studies cannot be directly compared. Here you see um, the effect on nasal polyp score. And of course, uh, nasal polyp score is not very important for the patient, but nice for the ENT surgeon to look at. And again, uh, no placebo effect, uh, but a significant effect on the polyp score in DUPI, in the MAPO study, and definitely also in the omalizumab study. In this study, a little bit less in the larger study at the end. Very important effect of biologicals, um, and especially, I think, of dupilumab, is the fantastic effect on loss of smell. Patients come in during a trial and say, doctor, I know I have the drug uh, right after the first uh, one or two injections because they get their smell back. And that's a really fantastic thing to see in our patients. And you see here the data for the three different uh, uh, biologicals. Here the uh, uh, questionnaire, loss of smell, and here for Dupi and omalizumab also the um, effect on the upset. Because these new treatments are uh, very expensive, um, they're about um, 
10,000 euro per year, it's important that we choose the right patients to get these treatments. And here are the indications for biological treatments in patients with chronic rhinosinus sinusitis with nasal polyps that had sinus surgery. And in EPOS, we said the patient needs at least three criteria before they should be eligible for biological treatment. And these criteria are evidence of type 2 inflammation, which we set a cutoff point of uh, tissue eosinophils over 10 per high power field or blood eosinophils over 250 or total IgE over 100 need for systemic corticosteroids or contraindication where we said more than two courses per year or long-term corticosteroid treatment, low-dose corticosteroid treatment, significant impaired quality of life, more than 40 in a SNOT22, anosmic on a smell test, and a diagnosis of comorbid asthma that need regular inhaled corticosteroids. So three criteria for the patient to be eligible for biological treatment. Of course, it's also very important to define a response to biological treatment. And we haven't yet made a quantification of the response as we did for the, uh, alleged, for the inclusion criteria. But um, we advise you to ev evaluate the same five criteria if all five response, there is an excellent response. If none is improved, there is no response, and you can see moderate and poor in the middle. At this moment, we advise patients after 16 weeks, if there's absolutely no response, to stop the biological treatment and evaluate the treatment response after one year. So if we now go back to our uh, management scheme of diffuse bilateral chronic rhinosinus sinusitis. And again, I would like to emphasize the importance of using this new classification to help you to find the right treatment for your patient. But if we now, for this moment, um, look again at the biologicals, you see a position here <coughs> in type 2 disease, type 2 diffuse bilateral chronic rhinosinus sinusitis. Patients have had uh, oral corticosteroids and most of the patients will have had sinus surgery. In the patients that are uncontrolled in a situation like this, we can consider these additional treatments. And biologicals, as I showed you, is a marvelous new option in our treatment amentarium. But also aspirin desensitization in patients with NERD, uh, uh, corticosteroid taper and revision surgery are options in these patients. Finally, I would like to point you at the integrated care pathway for pediatric chronic rhinosinus sinusitis. Here, it's important to realize that also in children, Intranasal corticosteroids are the hallmark of the treatment of chronic rhinosinus sinusitis. If that is uh, insufficient and patients are referred to secondary or ter tertiary care, the first thing we do is a history and a full ENT examination, including nasal endoscopy, to differentiate uh, as good as we can adenoid hypertrophy, of course, especially in younger children, children who do not have chronic rhinosinus sinusitis, but for example, uh, allergic rhinitis, and children with primary chronic rhinosinus sinusitis. The first thing we think of in secondary and tertiary care is whether this is actually a, a real primary chronic rhinosinus sinusitis or secondary to other diseases like cystic fibrosis or PCD. We have to test that first. If we're convinced it's a primary chronic rhinosinus sinusitis, we try with appropriate medical treatment like saline rinsing, extremely important, and intranasal corticosteroids. If that's insufficient, we can make a CT scan. 
if there is a low Lund Mackay score, it's very important, uh, very uh, likely that the adenoid is the main problem, and we advise to do an adenoidectomy followed by appropriate medical treatment. If there is a high Lund Mackay score, uh, it can be worthwhile to do an adenoidectomy with irrigation of the si uh, of the maxillary sinus, following followed by appropriate medical treatment. If that is insufficient, uh, 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 FES can be considered. You can read what all the things I told you today and many more in the full EPOS document, 460 pages that you can download for free from the Rhinology website or the EPOS 2020 website. Thank you very much for listening. Okay. okay, well, thank you for some very interesting questions. Uh, obviously, the majority are, are directed to Professor Falkins relating to the lecture. Um, there is one question that's come in which uh, relates a little bit um, to well, both the lecture I gave yesterday and the, um, de and the classification system which uh, Professor Falkins referred to. Uh, and that is somebody says that, uh, asks why, how can we uh, screen to differentiate primary diffuse disease from secondary diffuse disease? And it's a very good question, and it's all down to uh, differential diagnosis. And uh, fortunately uh, for us as ENT surgeons, we have at our disposal things that will help us make that distinction, uh, be it endoscopic examination um, or, um, and or imaging. Um, and clearly, if we think about the sort of things in the secondary group, these are the patients who will often uh, be resistant to the appropriate therapy that has been tried both in primary care and possibly secondary care already with intranasal corticosteroids and um, uh, saline irrigation. Um, and the history itself may also um, help us to make that determination because in the diffuse secondary, uh, we're looking at a sort of systemic pathology um, having its effect on the nose and sinuses. And so there may well be other uh, systemic symptoms and uh, signs, as, as we might see in vasculitis, that will give us the clue. But it can sometimes be very difficult because in localised uh, GPA, for example, um, we don't always get much more in the way of systemic symptoms. And therefore, we have to always have a low threshold for doing some additional tests such as uh, blood tests for vasculitis, et cetera, or immune uh, studies if the patient might have a uh, specific immune deficiency, if we have a patient who is not improving with their appropriate medical therapy and surgery. Yes, that's, uh, I think, a very important remark, Valerie. One of the other questions, uh, or some of the questions are more to, uh, related to treatment, and one is, Will you give the film up for anosmic patients who have no polyps? And of course, that's a very relevant question. Um, at the moment, um, I do not think there is a, um, a possibility to prescribe Dipixen uh, for patients without uh, nasal polyps because nasal polyp is uh, part of the re registration. However, you can imagine that um, it, it will be effective in patients who fulfill the criteria. So patients with type 2 inflammation not having polyps, uh, but uh, severe asthma, type 2 inflammation, and uh, loss of smell, etc. cetera. Um, I think at this moment, um, from the ENT point of view, it's not possible to do that because there we, there's only an indication for a patient with nasal polyps. But of course, you can help, ask your help from uh, if the patient has severe asthma. You can ask your help from the from your pulmonology colleagues and ask them to prescribe because of the asthma and uh, then uh, see whether it also has a positive influence on uh, the uh, eosinophilic CRS. So, uh, yes, from a pathophysiological point of view, we can expect it to work, but um, most likely at this moment, it's not possible from, uh, from um, um, the registration of the, of the product.
Um, another question is, um, the use of omelizumab is possible in IgE range from 30 to 1500, and you give a cutoff of IgE uh, of 100. Um, and can you explain this difference? Um, I think there is a difference. Well, let's first say omelizumab at this moment is not retrovenous. So uh, it can only be prescribed by, by uh, pulmonologists, for example, but not by uh, otorhinolaryngologists, although we expect it to be um, uh, registered uh, in, in somewhere this year. Uh, and so I don't know what exactly will be the, uh, the, the registration. We decided to take uh, IgE cutoff of 100 to have a larger chance of having um, a type 2 in inflammation in polyps. Of course, omelizumab is also given to uh, children with um, asthma. Uh, and uh, if you have a, a, an allergic asthma, it, it's very clear that uh, the chance of omelizumab being uh, um, effective because it's type 2 is very large. However, in polyps, if the IgE is very low and there are no eosinophils, uh, it's probably not type 2 disease and then pro probably omelizumab would not be the first choice. So that is the reason for choosing 100, but all these uh, criteria are, are very fresh and although they have uh, come together with a, with, a long, with long discussions of the steering group, I can imagine that they will change over time in the, in the next years. Um, the, uh, oh, very nice question. What should I ask my pathologist when reviewing the polyp disease? I think that's a really relevant question. Um, well, you know, it very much depends on how um, uh, interested and experienced your pathologist is. Uh, the, the least you can ask him is, or her, is, uh, uh, where there are eosinophils and how many eosinophils per high power field. So not only there was eosinophilia, but asked to quantify the eosinophils. If you have a more interested um, uh, pathologist in, in upper airway disease, a very interesting question can be how much IgE is are actually in the tissue. And um, another very important question is, whether these eosinophils are activated and pathologists or labs like mine use activation mar uh, markers like uh, BMP or IgE2, uh, IgE2 to actually define that the eosinophils are activated. But for daily clinical practice, um, having high power fields counted um, for eosinophilia is probably the, the most important factor that you're going to use in your, in your daily work. Well, we thank you very much for your questions. Again, we will answer the other questions uh, in due time on the EPOS 2020 website, and you can find our answers there. But now I would like to introduce uh, again uh, Professor Valerie Lund to uh, talk about the treatment, the more general treatment of chronic rhinitis sinusitis in adults. Valerie. I've been asked to talk about the treatment of chronic rhinus sinusitis in adults, um, and I'm going to give you a very quick overview of the way in which medical and surgical treatments interplay, and in particularly emphasize that we are not dealing with single treatments in isolation, and that it's really a comprehensive approach and a comprehensive utilization of those treatments that give our patients the best outcome. And as we can see below, sandwiches come in many varieties. Now in EPOS, there's a very big section looking at all the different uh, medications that are available to us. And indeed looking at the systematic reviews on all of these if they exist and looking at the uh, really critically at the evidence. And uh, we see here a list of things that you're all very familiar with together with others. And uh, the ones in sort of pink at the bottom are ones that hitherto uh, the randomized controlled trials have been performed but have been negative. You will have seen the uh, integrated care pathways already from Professor Fockens and of course when we first see our patient with diffuse CRS 
we have a range of appropriate medical therapy, which usually uh, includes some form of nasal steroid, uh, saline rinses, uh, plus some uh, discussions, obviously, on how to use them, and sometimes with the consideration of oral corticosteroids. So do these things work? Well, certainly in the literature, there's a, a, a great amount of, li of literature to support the use of topical corticosteroids, be it uh, usually in spray form. They have a long uh, history of being effective and safe. There are over 41 randomized controlled trials which show symptom improvement, positive impact on quality of life, and uh, in particular in patients who have polyps, showing uh, an even greater effect size than those without. However, there doesn't seem to be much of a difference between the various uh, steroid preparations on the market. However, the side effects are minimal. There's never been any real increase in infection demonstrated. But what they have consistently shown is that these uh, preparations work best after surgery, in other words, into a cavity. And below you see the uh, mesh analysis uh, displayed as a forest plot with the little mark here on the uh, side of the steroids. Um, as uh, indicated. Many of you be, will be aware of the interest and use of intranasal steroid irrigations that have become extremely popular, particularly in the post-operative period. Quite a lot of open studies available, but only four true double-blind placebo-controlled randomized trials with over two, just over 230 patients. And these have used, in one case, mimetazone, and in three cases, budesonide versus saline as the control arm. However, the dosage has been variable. The duration of the treatment has also varied from four to 52 weeks, and a range of outcomes have been used in these studies. Interestingly, the study using mimetazone showed significant improvement in the visual analog score, the SNOT22, and the Lund-Mackay score on CT. But those uh, using budesonide, which is certainly used very widely uh, around the world, um, didn't actually show any significant difference for the addition of the steroid. In the one study looking at adrenal function, there was certainly no evidence of suppression. So this does leave a, a slight question mark um, about the use of budesonide, but certainly supports the use of mimetazone as uh, part of the irrigation in the post-operative situation. Niels Mergen used to say, why treat 70 kilograms when you can treat two grams? And certainly we have improved nasal drug delivery now available to us in the form of eluting stents and in various delivery devices, um, as shown here uh, with luticasone. There are three uh, double-blind placebo-controlled trials looking at eluting stents in the office, in other words, before patients have undergone surgery. And these have compared mimetazone with placebo, and being a commercial preparation, the dosage and the uh, duration of the trial um, have been the same in all three studies. And interestingly, the study showed significant improvement in the symptoms, polyp size, and the need for surgery. And thus, in the uh, forest plot, we can see that the improvement and uh, favor is uh, there for the corticosteroid. What about short courses of systemic corticosteroids? We've certainly use them a lot, particularly in patients with nasal polyps. In fact, there are now seven uh, proper trials using uh, oral corticosteroids versus placebo with over 400 patients. Most of the trials have used oral prednisolone, but again, there is a variable dosage. These are not commercially driven uh, studies and variable duration and follow-up. Looking at the outcomes, there is overall improvement in the initial few weeks following the treatment. But if you continue to follow the patients up to uh, three months, for example, unfortunately that difference disappears in the symptoms, even though uh, the patients still have a reduction in their nasal polyp size. And uh, these uh, forest plots show that um, if you compare the total symptom score at two weeks with the total symptom score at 10 to 12 weeks, you can see that there is a shift Whereas with the actual polyp score, although there is a reduction in the size of the polyp, it's still significantly better uh, than for the placebo group. Saline irrigation has been used since time immemorial, and the terminology which we preferred was irrigation or rinsing. Um, of course, it's impossible to have a true placebo arm in these uh, studies, uh, but uh, of the 33 um, done in over 800 patients, 20 showed improvement in symptoms, endoscopy, quality of life, and imaging. 
of the different concentrations, isotonic saline or ringer's lactate seemed to be better than hypertonic, but the method, the concentration, volume, pressure, frequency, temperature, and head position are all up for debate. However, on balance, we felt confident to recommend the use of saline irrigation, but we couldn't really recommend one method over another. People have been interested in adding things to the saline irrigation for some time, of course. And if we look in the literature, then there is positive evidence in favor of the use of xylitol, sodium hyaluronate, and xyloglucan. But so far, there has not been positive evidence for the use of surfactants, shampoo, manuka honey, and these other things in the list. When it comes to antibiotics, in the literature, there's quite a bit of debate as to what constitutes a short-term course and what a long-term course with considerable uh, range. The EPOS panel agreed that four weeks or less would be the break. So if you give it for less than four weeks, it's short-term. If you give it for more than four weeks, then it's long-term. And of course, we recognize that the reason for giving short-term antibiotics is primarily for an acute bacterial infection whereas the longer term courses are tapping into the immunomodulatory properties of the uh, antibiotic. There are rather few uh, trials in the literature for short courses, mainly treating acute exacerbations. They don't have placebo arms and they don't show advantage between the different treatments. So really, they can't be uh, recommended as a, a principal treatment in its, uh, this condition. If we look at the study on doxycycline coming from our colleagues in Ghent, um, the doxycycline was given for three weeks, um, which actually doesn't fulfill the criteria that we've now agreed for long-term use. It did show improvement in the, um, uh, in the outcomes that were chosen, um, and indeed just outperformed the uh, methylprednisolone in the trial. Um, but as you can see here, the statistical uh, difference, whilst being significant, was only just significantly different between it and the steroid. There's been a lot of interesting macrolides recently. We know it's, they've been used for a long time in Japan for non-eosinophilic lower airway disease. Um, and indeed, used for long periods of time in low doses were shown to improve the um, survival of patients with these conditions. But it was also recognized that the levels in the sputum serum were way below the minimum inhibitory concentration, which rather supported the immunomodulatory effect uh, being uh, the most important aspect. It was also important to use the medication for a significant period of time because at the end of a couple of weeks of treatment, uh, very few patients derive benefit. But once you get that benefit, it seemed that there was uh, continued benefit for a period of time. When we looked in the literature, there were two uh, papers that were suitable for a mesh analysis, uh, one from Walworth uh, looking at roxithromycin, the other done by ourselves, uh, uh, in 2011 using azithromycin. And whilst the length of uh, treatment was 12 weeks in both cases, the dosage used in the azithromycin uh, trial was very uh, small indeed. Um, when you compare the outcomes, the patients with roxithromycin did rather well, uh, and particularly in those patients who had normal or low IgE levels. Unfortunately, in the azithromycin study, the IgE was not measured. However, when you combine them in a forest plot, of course, they cancel each other out, uh, which leads to the conclusion that uh, macrolides don't work. And I think uh, perhaps um, it is an issue because if we look in the literature, there are a number of randomized controlled trials, for example, uh, for clarithromycin, but for various methodological reasons, they're not suitable for a meta-analysis. What is interesting is that uh, clarithromycin actually does work more effectively than erythromycin in these low dose studies that were done in Japan. So not all macrolides are equal either. And uh, just to add something else into the mix, so we know that there's been some uh, concerns about the cardiac effects of macrolides, uh, looking at some large epidemiological studies uh, systematically reviewed here, we can see that short term use um, has been associated with an estimated excess of 1.79 myocard lympharbs per thousand patients. So we have to bear this in mind when we're going to use these drugs, take a careful history and even do an ECG if we think we would like to use them. Which patients would benefit from them? Well, as we've said, the non-eosinophilic T1 mediated disease um, with low uh, eosinophils.
But because of this uh, problem with the evidence, uh, EPOS was uncertain whether to recommend the use of the long-term antibiotics. And this was also because we know that there are several large trials being presently undertaken in Europe, which hopefully will answer this question more definitively in the near future. Looking at our integrated care pathway, we can see that if the appropriate medical therapy that I've just talked about uh, doesn't work, then we can consider other uh, investigations divide, to divide our patients up into those with and without uh, type 2 predominant disease. And that opens up other possibilities, be it long-term antibiotics or oral corticosteroids or, of course, uh, surgery. When do you operate? Well, after appropriate medical therapy has failed. But there are wide variation rates of surgery around the world, as you can see here. We know from studies from North America that the surgical cohorts seem to perform better uh, than the medical cohorts and that uh, medically treated patients will sometimes cross over in the trial, over 30% in this trial, during the first year of follow-up, uh, suggesting that we shouldn't keep our patients forever on their medical therapy. It's also been shown in this study from North America that endoscopic surgery becomes more cost-effective with time, uh, particularly by the third year post-operatively when compared uh, with medication alone. So we know in the literature that there is a, a lot of uh, evidence, albeit not uh, placebo control, to suggest that surgery is important and an important part of our armamentarium um, and certainly um, is associated with uh, benefit in uh, the majority of patients. That benefit is uh, maintained over five years, as we showed in the sinonasal audit, and the uh, benefit in terms of improvement in SNOT22 is certainly a very uh, significant improvement, uh, greater than the MCID. However, it's important that we select our patients carefully because if patients have low SNOT scores, then they are unlikely to benefit from that treatment. Patients with polyps do better than those without at all time points. And as you might expect, revision surgery was more frequent in those patients undergoing a less extensive surgery. But it took five years for that to be demonstrated statistically. Another outcome from that study was to show that if patients had their surgery earlier, i.e. within 12 months of the onset of their symptoms, they did rather better than those patients who waited for much longer, between 12 to 60 months, and particularly if they waited for longer than 60 months to undergo their operation. And we know there may be many reasons why that would be the case. Certainly, we can postulate that the uh, reduction in inflammatory load, remodeling, presence of biofilms and microbiome disturbance, to say nothing of the development of osteitis, um, if those can be averted, then that, that may well lead to a better outcome. But it may simply be down to the fact that early surgery allows better irrigation and installation of topical steroids. And if we look at the evidence for post-operative intervention, uh, we can see in the literature that whilst the evidence is poor for debridement, saline irrigations and the use of corticosteroids are both very effective, both in the short term and long term, in maintaining and uh, reducing the chance of recurrence. So if patients are doing well, they can continue with their appropriate medical therapy, as shown in the, in the care pathway. But we do have to recognize that there are a group of patients who perhaps do not do so well and for whom we have to consider other um, options. I'm grateful to uh, Dr. Carrie Wasson for this slide, and you will have heard from Professor Fockens the various points in the cytokine cascade that medication is now being developed for and used in CRS. We also have other options. Aspirin desensitization has been shown in a number of randomized controlled trials to be useful in improving parameters in patients who have um, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory disease sensitivity. But we also have to undertake revision surgery in our patients, and that can occur in possibly 10% of patients or more, uh, depending on the circumstances. So at the end of this, I'd just like to emphasize that we're not talking about cure in our patients. We're trying to control them, and we're controlling them, hopefully, with a comprehensive management. CRS is a medically managed disease in which surgery plays an important role, and it's most important um, that those uh, slices and parts of our sandwich, if you like, are held together and overarched by the education of our patients and physicians. And that way, we will get the best in ingredients for success. Thank you very much. Okay, well, welcome back. And uh, we've 
got a number of uh, questions that have come in uh, both from yesterday and today that are pertinent to this particular um, talk. Um, and one of these was regarding the role of antihistamines in the treatment of both acute or chronic rhinosinusitis. Uh, we know that these are very widely uh, used um, and uh, it's quite interesting if you look in the literature because if we look at um, acute um, rhinosinusitis, um, the evidence is really very poor indeed. Um, there may be some short-term effect, um, but certainly in the long term, they don't really provide uh, very much benefit. And uh, certainly uh, patients who benefit most are those who actually also have allergies. And that also applies to the patients with chronic rhinosinusitis. There's only a couple of studies in the literature. Um, some of them had allergic patients in the group. Uh, certain outcomes um, in, did not improve, such as uh, total symptoms, uh, whereas one or two of the others did. Um, so the base position for the EPOS steering group was that at the moment, we didn't really have sufficient evidence to recommend them. Uh, another question was asking how we define the cutoff between moderate and severe CRS. Um, we chose to use the visual analog score, uh, but equally you can use the SNOP22 uh, to make that distinction very simply um, by looking at a score of 0 to 10. Um, and if you have uh, symptoms which are between um, 4 and uh, 7, then it would be moderate. And if it was greater than seven up to 10, it would be severe. Um, you could make an analogy between this and the control table that we've used. In other words, the moderate might fit in with the partially controlled and the severe with the uncontrolled. And uh, using those criteria, you'd also include things like um, a quality of life questions such as um, sleep uh, disturbance or fatigue and the need for uh, rescue medication. So there are a variety of ways in which we can do it in a, a fairly simple way uh, based on, on history and a, and a simple visual analog score. Uh, another person has asked about um, intranasal corticosteroids combined with depot corticosteroid injections for better results. It's really interesting this because historically uh, depot corticosteroids were used a lot, certainly in the UK uh, for the treatment of seasonal allergy, for example. Um, but they really went out of fashion, I would say, uh, largely because you can get some local effects such as muscle um, atrophy if it's not put in correctly. And of course, the main disadvantage is once you've given it, you can't take it back. And so people have kind of moved away from giving depot um, injections of these things um, because of that uh, potential for some side effects. Um, if you look at uh, depot injections in the nose itself, uh, that was also done in the 70s, 60s and 70s. But again, there were a few cases of blindness which were reported. Um, and um, that was largely probably due to particulate matter getting into the retinal circulation from the turbulence uh, by retrograde flow. But at the end of the day, unfortunately, um, you know, that was sufficient to uh, knock that on the head as well. So we're not uh, using the depot uh, these days. Um, and um, then there's a question relating to the use of nasal stents. Um, I showed you in my talk that they have been shown to be useful before surgery, in other words, in the office, um, and actually may defer uh, the need for surgery. And there are also studies showing that post-operatively um, they uh, enhance uh, healing and um, reduce recurrence. But of course, all of these things come with a cost. And I think we have to be aware that all these devices can be quite expensive and not applicable to every healthcare um, uh, setup. And I can say that because in the NHS, they're not readily available to everybody for post-operative treatment. So I think we've uh, come to the end of the session. Um, I'm very uh, grateful to you all for uh, sitting through it and for asking interesting questions. If we missed your question, as Jessica uh, said, we'll put them up onto the website and uh, have some answers for you in due course. Um, this session will be streamed again this afternoon at five o'clock and uh, Professor uh, Kern will be moderating it then and you may have some interesting questions for him about pathophysiology. And then I hope that uh, you'll also be able to join us tomorrow um, at the same time, same place um, for a very interesting uh, group of talks from four other splendid presenters looking at burden of disease, the treatment of acute rhinosinusitis, the comorbidities, and indeed the treatment of children.
So we very much hope that you'll join us again then and we thank you for your attention. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye.